Greetings. Welcome back to the fifth in a series of lessons on life of faith, lessons from the Psalms, where we're identifying characteristics of a faithful life, and hopefully we can learn to incorporate those same characteristics into our own walk, our daily walk. The first week we talked about the characteristic of staying rooted, making sure we're planted in the practices that will grow our faith. The second week, Joe reminded us that we should be confident that we are restored. God wants a relationship with us, and we can count on that. I talked the third week about living authentically, and that was not trying to put on being someone you're not. When you're hurting, you're hurting. And we as Christians need to let other Christians know when that's happening. We are not meant to walk this journey alone. So we were encouraged to share freely and to care deeply when we're... When we're um, confronted with someone who is hurting and needs our help. This week, the characteristic is something very near and dear to my heart. As a teacher by profession, it's remain teachable. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 119. So if you want to look it up, go ahead and look that up now. Don't panic. It's super long, but we're not going to read the whole thing for this lesson. If you've ever served on a nominating committee at your church, you've probably had this experience. You call somebody and you ask them if they'll serve in a certain position. And they say, oh, no, thank you. I just retired. I've done my time. Well, of course, what you want to say is you want to drop the guilt bomb on them and remind them that Moses was 80 years old when he was first called to serve God. But you don't do that. You thank them and you wish them a happy retirement. There is nothing in Scripture that tells us when we are to stop serving and growing in God. That's even true in the secular world. It's been documented that adults who continue to learn as they age fare better physically and mentally and emotionally than those who do not. Here's some great examples. Julia Childs, you know her, the wonderful chef, she didn't learn to cook till she went to France when she was 36, and she didn't publish her first cookbook till she was 50. Ray Kroc of McDonald's fame didn't buy his first McDonald's till he was 59. Laura Ingalls Wilder, published her first book, Little House on the Prairie, we all know that one, when she was 65. Anna Mary Robertson Moses, or we know her as Grandma Moses, didn't even take up painting till she was 78. And Harry Bernstein, the beloved author, published his first book when he was 96. And he's quoted as saying, my 90s were the most productive years of my life. Isn't that amazing? Remain teachable. There's no difference when it comes to our spiritual life either. We are meant to continue to grow in our faith through the Word of God every day of our life as long as we live. Second Timothy, and I love this translation. It's really spot on. It's from um, the message. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped shaped up for the task God has for us. Isn't that a beautiful explanation of the goodness that comes from God's Word if we just listen to it? 119, Psalm 119, was written by someone who absolutely loved the Word of God. It's called the Celebration of the Living Law. Now, here's some fun facts about it. First of all, it's the longest psalm in the book of Psalms, 176 verses, and it's an acrostic poem. So it's kind of interest. That's kind of interesting. It had the Hebrew language had um, 22 letters in the alphabet. So in Psalm 119, each stanza begins with a letter of the alphabet, and then it's followed by eight lines that are a discussion on a synonym for the Word of God. In some of them, they use law, precepts, testimonies, word. All of those are the same thing. It's the general word of God. It's believed that Psalm 119 was used more as a personal meditation than a song, like many of the other psalms were used. Now, some scholars are really critical of 119. They say it's too long, it's too redundant, we get it, you love God's word. But most scholars have come to really appreciate it. It was written with great care and intentionality. And the writer is trying to show us and emphasize that Scripture holds everything we need to live this life and live it fruitfully and in an abundant way, as Jesus has told us to do, if we just absorb it and live it. 
Um, we see this hunger for God and his word in other parts of the psalm, like Psalm 1, which we've already talked about a few weeks ago. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. In Psalm 42, one of my favorites, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. The profound love of God's word and the deep desire to learn and understand more and more of it permeates the psalm. That's all the psalm is about. And throughout the psalm, the psalmist admits that it's not always easy. He's challenged by not just his own folly and temptations, but by oppressors and people who are persecuting him because he is trying to follow it. One verse says, keep me from being distracted from God's precepts. He wants so to follow him, but it is a challenge in the life. And the very last, I love the very last verse of this psalm. It says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. In other words, I want to obey, help me. And that's really, I think, all of our cry. Before we, we're only going to read about six verses from this psalm. So um, I want to kind of give you a good feel of the essence of what the writer is saying in this. So I want to share a sampling of some of the phrases throughout the entire psalm so you'll get a good picture of what he's describing. And it gives you the heart and soul of what the psalmist is saying. We'll start with the first one, which says, Teach me your statutes. Lead me in the path of understanding. I remember your name in the night and keep thy law. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. So this psalmist meditates on God's word and has it in his mind all day and all night. That's how big a priority this is in his life. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. Now, what this means is the desire for more and more of God's understanding, even of things that he already knows. And haven't we all been there? We've read a verse that we've read a hundred times before, and all of a sudden we read it, and boom, the light goes on. We have a fresh insight or a new application for our life. That's what he means by this. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. Help me discern. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Priceless, in other words. How sweet are your words to my taste, and sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Great peace have those who love your laws. Nothing can make them stumble. Your word gives freedom. And then towards the very end of the psalm, I love this verse. Let my soul live, that it may praise you, and let your ordinances help me. Let my soul live that it may praise you. What a wonderful life that is. And we need God's ordinances to help us stay in that constant state of praise. Now, to be clear, God alone is the foundation of our faith. But the scripture, as someone once said, is God's love letter to us, helping us understand all the promises God has in his word that can help us fulfill that abundant life Jesus promises in the New Testament. Um, there was a teacher, Everett Storms, who many years ago took two full years scouring through the Bible, and he identified every single promise he found in Scripture. And he identified a total of 8,810 promises. Out of those promises, 7,487 of them were promises by God to man. 7,487 promises from God to us in the scripture. And what are these promises that we find in this wonderful word? Promises to care for us when we're in need, comfort when we grieve, strength when we fail, courage when we're afraid, wisdom when we need to know God's will and how we should move forward. Clearly, God's word is a road map we can apply all the days of our lives in every situation. The psalmist knows this and wants us to know it too and to believe this. We're going to read now in Psalm 119. I've only selected six verses. I really would encourage you to read the entire psalm. It really is beautiful and, and meditate on it and think about it. But we're only going to pick six verses and these, there's nothing very special about them except that I thought they kind of encapsulated the whole thought behind what the psalmist was trying to say. Um, so open up to Psalm 119, 
verse 129, and we're going to read through 136. Here we go. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who love your name. And another other translation says it is your habit. In other words, God is gracious towards those who love him. 133. Establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Or another translation puts it, for your law is not obeyed. I want to point out a, a couple of highlights in this particular section that we read. Go back to 130, verse 130. The unfolding of your word, the unfolding of your words gives light. And this is painting a, an amazing picture, and I want to paint that for you. Back when the Hebrew language was first being developed, they were Bedouins, so they traveled through the desert and they lived in tents primarily. So picture this in a hot, bright desert. They, this, you had this big tent and you were in it, and so it was almost practically dark. And the only opening you had was the flap of cloth across the very front of the tent. So the picture that's being painted in this verse is that of being in the tent, and suddenly this flap goes up, and the tent is flooded with light. Every corner of it is illuminated. And that's the picture that we want painted in this, in that scripture opens our eyes and puts light on everything. It makes everything clear, not more confusing. It makes it clearer for us. It illuminates. And we've all seen that happen in our own lives when we've studied scripture, some, something, a new light that's come on when we've read it. I also want to look at, um, notice that it says in the same verse, it gives understanding to the simple. This is telling us anybody can understand the scripture. The light is meant to, to illuminate this for everybody. So I've always loved that about the gospel. It's so simple. You know, we, man has made it very complicated with all of the rules and regulations we've added to it. But the gospel itself, the story of Jesus, is really very simple. A seven-year-old and a rocket scientist could sit and talk about it. And that's how I think it was meant to be, so anyone can understand it. Look down at verse 136. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. This psalmist not only feels some sorrow we see throughout the psalm for his own uh, shortfalls when he feels he doesn't keep it like he should, but when he sees others not keeping it and the consequences they must suffer because of it. This verse brought to mind years ago, I had the television on during the day, I was at home, and it was the day of the Columbine shootings, and you remember that was really the first mass school shooting we had, and I remember watching those young teenagers running out of the building and hearing the story unfold in the news, and I just sat on my couch and I wept, and it wasn't just for those victims. I thought to myself, how did those two young men ever get to that point that they would do something like that. That just broke my heart. I had teenagers myself, and I just thought that that's just such a tragedy. And I think that's how this psalmist looks at with sadness that if we keep the precepts of God, good things will happen. And it makes him very sad when people don't see that and embrace that. And I know many of you feel the same sort of compassion when you see awful things happening. Um, these are very isolating times. There are a lot of things we cannot do because they're not safe to do right now. But you know what? Studying God's Word is not one of them. You can delve into God's Word anytime, any way you want to. There are thousands of published Bible studies out there. You could go online and just pull off the promises of God from Scripture and meditate on one of those every day and pray about it. That's a rich experience. What I've done sometimes is if there's been a theme or a word that I've been tossing around, I will do a study on it myself. Like One summer I decided to look at the word trust in the Bible, and I took it with a concordance, and I just followed trust, the thread of trust, all through Scripture. And it was amazing what I learned. It, new things I'd, I'd never, never thought about before. Um, so you can study God's Word uh, 
sitting in your, even though we can't do much else right now, that is something we can do that will deeply enrich your life. I love this quote by Archibald MacLeish, who is a writer and a poet. He said, religion is at its best when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. It is at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everybody else. I want to read that again because I think this is very important. Religion is at its best when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. It is at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everybody else. One of the top reasons non-Christians give for rejecting Christianity is they say Christians are too judgmental. And as much as I hate to admit it, they're not wrong. Not only are we known to criticize people for not living the way we think they should by our standards and the behavior they should be having, we criticize one another. Church A accuses Church B of being liberal and non-biblical in their doctrines, and Church B accuses Church A of being conservative bigots. And that goes on all the time, and other people are watching when this happens. In the early church, in uh, 197, there was a Christian theologian called uh, uh, Tertullian, Tertullian. And he was writing to the Roman government kind of pleading for justice for the Christians who were being persecuted and giving reasons why Rome should protect them. And one of his arguments was, look at them. Look how kind and caring they are to others and to each other. And you've probably heard the famous line from it, look how they love one another. That was, what, that was his argument to Rome saying, yeah, this is a good thing you have among you. How did we get from there to how, where we are today, but we are perceived, love is the last thing that many people perceive the church as exemplifying. How did we get there? I think part of the problem is that many of us have stopped being teachable. It's so much easier if it's black and white, if it's right and wrong, without having to consider the nuances of the gray. Even Jesus often answered questions with questions. I mean, we, we have to be very careful about that. That's what, that can get us in trouble. There was a well-known preacher many years ago who preached frequently and vehemently against the deadly sin of divorce until his daughter got divorced. Then he became very teachable. And all of us need to be that way, though, all the time. We don't need to wait until something happens to make us sit back and go, okay, God, what should I learn from this? Remain open and teachable. When we think we have all the spiritual answers, we've stopped being teachable. We have to be careful. The psalmist tells us in one of the verses, which I love, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. And that word wonderful really means miraculous in, in, in the translation. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. I want to understand that I want to know it and I want to keep it. And keep teaching me, keep opening my eyes and my heart to what you have to say. Many of you are familiar with the old hymn, Standing on the Promises. It's been around since the 1800s. It was written by Russell Carter, who was a doctor and a minister and a teacher. Um, and it, but the story behind Standing, behind, standing, by the, standing on the Promises is, is interesting. At the age of 30, he was diagnosed with a heart condition that at the time they thought was going to be fatal. And so what he did, this is part of, I'm going to read you part from his biography about this, which led to him writing this hymn, Standing on the Promises. He knelt and made a promise that healing or no, his life was finally and forever consecrated to the service of the Lord. Scripture took on a new life for him. He truly began to lean on all the promises in Scripture, no matter what. He lived another 49 years, but professed that whatever God did, whether he healed or not, he would continue to stand on the promises from God's Word. What promise from God's Word do you need to hold on to today? Are you open to God teaching you fresh insights about old attitudes and beliefs? What action can you take this week to dive deeply into God's Word 
to show you truths that can nourish and sustain you. The psalmist in 119 so wants us to grasp that, that it's there for the taking. All we have to do is read it, absorb it, and ask God, and he will help us live it. Instead of a prayer tonight, today I want to close with one of the stanzas from that beautiful old hymn, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. I think if we all got up every morning and said or sang that verse, it would change the whole our whole attitude for the entire day. Thank you for being with me again. May God bless you and keep you in the coming week. And next week with uh, session six, we'll be talking about continuing to trust. Have a blessed week.